Thank you, Jared, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you all. And can I ask you to turn uh, in your Bible to that book of Two Kings again? Two Kings. Uh, if you're using one of the church Bibles, uh, that's on page 312. I'm sorry you forgot to bring your own Bible, but that's okay. There's one there, page 312, 2 Kings chapter 6. And I want to begin this morning with what I think is a fairly tough question. And it's this. What is the right response to terrible suffering? And by the right response, I, I, I don't mean something virtuous, um, like being brave. That's admirable, of course, if uh, I'm the one suffering, but that's not what I'm thinking about. Uh, giving to a relevant charity is a good thing to do when we learn of suffering somewhere in the world. But that's not quite what I'm getting at just now. I'm trying to think about the reaction of our hearts, the thoughts that go through our mind when we encounter or indeed when we experience terrible suffering. Many today see suffering either in their personal experience or in the unspeakable horrors of which we hear almost daily. Many today see suffering as reason enough to turn away from God. I cannot accept a God who would allow that to happen. Indeed, it seems to me that in our world today, the extraordinary antagonism towards God that we experience, I think, has this problem at its heart. Now, every age is antagonistic to God. We oughtn't to be surprised that our age is as antagonistic as it is, but in every age, it takes a different shape. And I've got a suspicion, I've got no analysis of this or no, no, no particular evidence, but it seems to me, uh, if, as you listen to some of the, the angry spokespeople, the people like the Richard Dawkins of this world and so on, uh, if you ask them why they will have nothing to do with God, this is the problem that comes to the fore most often. And I think it's common for many people today. I cannot accept a God who would allow that to happen. And I want to suggest that most of us feel at least some sympathy with this way of thinking. We sort of get it. We understand why a sufferer might want to have nothing to do with the God who did not prevent the suffering. You get that, don't you? And I'd be very surprised if there were many of us here this morning who haven't encountered people precisely like that and we struggle to find anything appropriate to say. I'm sure you've been in that situation. I certainly have. I'm going to go and see a friend who is going through something awful. What am I going to say? It makes no sense, of course, to suggest that God was not involved in the particular tragedy that has led someone to repudiate him. God is God. There's nothing that happens outside of his sovereign rule. He is God. And that includes the worst atrocities. There's no easy way out here. And we can't pretend that terrible suffering is less dreadful than it is. You can find yourself coming to the point of asking, how could the experience of dreadful suffering not drive a person away from God? How could that not happen? That's a real question, isn't it? And yet, the Bible's message and the experience of millions of believers down the centuries is that the right, the sensible, the best response to suffering, even the most dreadful, the real way in which to find hope in the face of horror, to not despair, is to turn to God. 
a strange message that is. And perhaps those of us who are very familiar with this message need to recognise how strange it is and how strange it must sound to those who will have nothing to do with God and are in the midst of or facing particular suffering. But it's actually the Christian message. We Christians, what do we say? We have been born again to a living hope. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in the passage that Jared read to us a moment ago, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Paul prayed that we may abound in hope. I'm sure you remember those words of Peter, the famous words of Peter in his letter where he urges us to always be prepared to make a defence to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And if you go through those passages, and there are many, many more in the New Testament, the New Testament just sort of reverberates with this message, and this hope of which the New Testament speaks so often, it's perfectly clear that this hope is typically experienced in circumstances of suffering. How is that possible? Really, what does it mean to turn to God when overwhelmed with suffering? How can we do that? How can we do that? Without denial, without pretense, without... And how does it make any difference to turn to God? How does hope work? And that's the sort of title that I've put over these couple of Sundays. How Hope Works is what we're going to try and think about. Now, uh, as uh, Jared mentioned some months ago, uh, you might remember, those of you with particularly good memories, uh, that we spent a few Sundays together looking at that rather unfamiliar book of the Old Testament that I hope you have open in front of you now, the book of Two Kings. And because I'm un able to think of anything more than one thing at a time we're going to go back there to the same book and what we saw earlier on was that these pages of this ancient history that we're looking at in two kings were surprisingly it was surprising to me when I discovered this um, rather powerfully relevant because there are striking parallels between what we read in 2 Kings, which is really the story about the disintegration of the Old Testament nation of Israel. And there are striking parallels between that story and the state of our world today. Now, I'm not going to go back over all that now, but this Sunday and next Sunday, I'd like us to turn to this particularly striking story that we're going to see in just a moment. It begins in chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 24 and it goes through to the end of chapter 7, just part one of the story this morning, we'll just be going through to the beginning of chapter 7, but it is a story, as we'll see in just a moment, about terrible, devastating suffering and about how hope in the midst of that suffering was in fact possible, how hope works. This week, part one, which I'll give the sort of subtitle for this week is How Hope Starts. All right? We've got three scenes we're going to be looking at. Scene one, I've titled Terrible Suffering. Scene one, Terrible Suffering. The situation is described in chapter 6, verse 24. Follow this with me. Afterward, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, mustered his entire army and went up and besieged Samaria. I want to ask you to try and picture the scene. Uh, Samaria, at this point of time, uh, was Israel's capital city. It's now surrounded by a huge, powerful, hostile, aggressive enemy army. What happens here, this is a siege, uh, no communications in or out of the city are possible, certainly no food supplies into the city are possible, Water is scarce, that's how a siege worked. Uh, it was uh, a brutal form of warfare in the ancient world. Uh, those occasions in which it's been practised in the modern world have been brutal. Uh, the potential suffering was horrendous. What happened really was that people in a besieged city faced slow death by starvation. 
Furthermore, verse 25, and there was a great famine in Samaria as they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dog, dove's dung, picture all this, was sold for five shekels of silver. The siege had come, you see, at the worst possible time. There was already a famine. The city had no food supplies set aside for a situation such as they now faced. The people were already hungry as the Syrian forces arrived and sealed off the city. And the description there, what you've got to try and imagine is the most undesirable forms of food that, that, that you can even conceive. And they would fetch enormous prices. That's what we're being told there. Uh, which would you prefer if you had the choice? Um, a, a donkey's head... I understand a donkey's head's got... I don't know anything about donkey's heads, but I've read that a donkey's head has almost no meat. It's just bone and gristle. Uh, or a handful of dove's dung. I won't try and describe that. But either, apparently, according to... In, in these days, you, you could pay almost a year's wages for either of those delicacies. Such was the stranglehold that the king of Assyria... Oh, sorry, the king of Syria and his army had on Samaria. But that's just the general scene. When you get to the particulars, it gets worse. In verse 26, we read that now the king of Israel was passing by on the wall. Um, he, the, 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 the troubled king, you can imagine uh, what was going through his mind as he had some sort of responsibility in this situation. Uh, I take it he was out on the, on the city wall taking stock of the situation. He might have been inspecting the the, the city's defences to see how things were. He had a lot on his mind. When suddenly, in verse 26, a woman cried out to him, saying, help my lord the king, help! That cry must have stung. The king knew he was unable to do anything to help his people. He responded, you see, verse 27, if the lord will not save you, how can I save you? from the threshing floor or from the wine press? There's nothing there, lady. What do you expect me to do? He was abrupt, but I think in his words you can hear his despair. Notice those words, if the Lord will not save you. I wonder what he was thinking. Did he think perhaps the terrible situation in which he and his people now found himself, this terrible situation was somehow a punishment from God. And in fact, that wouldn't be an entirely unreasonable thought if you had been looking at how this nation had been living. But if God is against us, if that's what this means, if God is against us, what can I do for you? No wonder he was depressed. But he pulled himself together, the king, and he asked the woman in verse 28, what is your trouble? And her reply really should have one of those trigger warnings that you get on the news each night. You notice those? They're all the time, aren't they? I just sort of, uh, I sit there listening to them wondering, couldn't you actually tell some other news that wasn't, didn't need a trigger warning? Be possible, that the, you know, the following report contains distressing content. Yeah, you chose it, I want to say to the news. But here, here it certainly contains distressing content. Are you, going to, are you prepared to read on in verse 28? Anyone who wants to block their ears, I understand. Go ahead. But she answered, This woman said to me, Give, me your, give your son that we may eat him today and we'll eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And on the next day I said to her, Give your son that we may eat him. And she's hidden her son. Words fail. You won't be surprised to hear that this is a story that hasn't made its way into many children's picture Bibles. Jared told me earlier on, we've worked out it's probably not true, but he, he told me that he thought that uh, Simon Manchester had once spoken on this story at a preschool service. <laughs> and my reply was, Simon Manchester's the only person I can imagine who could pull that off. It probably doesn't help much just to add this little bit of information 
I don't think it helps at all, really, but it, it's possible, of course, that the boys were already dead. But does that change anything? That's scene one. Terrible suffering. Scene two. Utter hopelessness. Verse 30, when the king heard the words of the woman, okay, he heard what she said, he tore his clothes, now he was passing by on the wall and the people looked and behold he had sackcloth beneath his body. This king was shaken by the woman's story. How could he not have been? He was the king and he could do nothing in this dreadful situation. He had nothing to offer her. What would you say? If you were the king, can you, can, can you, I mean, it's a pretty big effort of imagination, isn't it? But can you imagine yourself being that king that day in face with that woman? What would you, what would you say? What would you do? See, the fact that I, I think none of us can answer those questions, it just sort of illustrates that the, the hopelessness of this utterly hopeless situation. His torn clothes, the sackcloth, he was just a picture of anguish, humiliation and despair and that was the king. But listen to what then came out of his mouth. Verse 31. May God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. You hear what's going on? If God is against us, if God won't save us from this horror, if God is responsible for what we're going through right now, there's nothing I can do, but I'll tell you what, I can lash out. I can lash out at God's prophet. Elisha was, of course, God's man there in Samaria. You read the stories about him in the preceding pages. They're wonderful stories, really. But in his grief, in his despair, in his terror, this king turned against God's man. I'll tell you what, he will suffer. It was his way, of course, at lashing out at God. But again, I think it's not too much to say. We kind of get it don't we? There is at least a little bit, isn't there, of sympathy for that king? I asked a moment ago, what would you do? Maybe you wouldn't do this, but what would you do? In verse 32, the scene suddenly shifts and we move from the city wall and the king and his despair to Elisha's house. That was located somewhere in the city. And as we come to Elisha's house, we suddenly notice how different the atmosphere was in the prophet's house, how different from the atmosphere on the city wall with the troubled king. Verse 32, Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. There seems to be a, a strange calmness here. The city leaders, the elders... Uh, had chosen for some reason in, in these dire circumstances to join the man of God in his quiet composure. The impression you get from the description of this scene is that they were listening to Elisha. I wonder what he was saying to them. Whatever it was, it was about to be interrupted. For it's to, again in verse 32, now the king had dispatched a man from his presence, but before the messenger arrived, Elisha said to the elders, do you see how this murderer has sent to take off my head. Elisha had a strange way of knowing things. If you read his stories, you'll find out about that. But Elisha was under no illusions about the true character of the king. This murderer, he called him. And Elisha knew that the king's assassin was on his way, on his way to Elisha's house. Well, Elisha said to the old guys who were there with him, verse 32 again, look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold the door fast against him. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? 
And what, what we're starting to get here is a scene that I, I, I feel is almost comical if it weren't so serious. The old men quickly shut the front door and then they all lean with all their weight against it uh, to keep the king and his men, or his hitman, from, from, from entering. Uh, aware, of course, uh, as Elisha has just told them, that the king himself is not far behind. And while Elisha was still speaking, the king's man arrived. And outside the door, the closed door, with all the weight of the old men leaning against it, and he, he said, the, the, the king's messenger outside the door, he's speaking on behalf of the king, that's what a messenger does, he says, this trouble is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? This trouble is from the Lord. If you came to realise that, what would you do? Okay, your majesty, you may be right, this trouble is from the Lord. What are you going to do? There are a number of possibilities, I suppose. You could cry out to God for mercy. You could say, I can't handle this, I need God's help. But no, why should I wait? That's the Old Testament word for hope. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And you know what he's planning to do. If God's done this to me, I'm not going to have anything to do with him. If God's done this to me, God's now got an enemy on his hands. If God's done this to me, and again, in the circumstances, we mustn't play down the circumstances, in the circumstances, you sort of get that, don't you? You sort of, you can relate to it. Well, that's scene two, utter hopelessness but I think friends there are many of us who have been in that kind of darkness scene three last scene how hope starts there are now uh, a few people outside the front door of Elisha's house uh, there's the assassin uh, the king himself has arrived now and one or two others and on the inside, the old guys still have their weight against the door. But then, from inside the house, comes the calm, firm voice of Elisha. Chapter 7, verse 1, But Elisha said, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a seer of fine flour, not donkey's heads, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Now we'll come to the details in a moment, but first notice how these words from Elisha, ringing out from inside the house, introduced a new possibility into the hopeless circumstances in Samaria that day. The possibility was this. Hear the word of the Lord. You might say, really? How could that help? What difference could that make? Well, the word of the Lord then came from Elisha's lips in the form of an utterly astonishing promise. Within 24 hours, wholesome food will be available in Samaria at reasonable prices. The promise was at complete odds with the circumstances in Samaria that day. Nothing they could see could give them any hope. But what if they could hear the word of the Lord? And the word of the Lord was a promise, this promise, can you see how Elisha's call to the king and his henchmen and the elders and anyone else who was listening actually changed everything? Hear the word of the Lord. And dear friends, 
This is the point at which the experience of these troubled, suffering people at Elisha's house in Samaria on that day sort of connects with our experience today in our troubled, suffering world, in our troubled, suffering lives. You see, the word of the Lord, it's a theme that runs right through the Bible and it's a very big theme, it's a very big idea, it's a very big reality. For the Bible teaches that the God who really is there has given his word. The word of the Lord is God's commitment, God's promise. The word of the Lord, as you read it and and see how it develops in the pages of the Bible, is much bigger than the promise of food in Samaria. God has promised a day on which he will put everything right. Everything. No more tears. No more tears. None. No more pain. No more sadness. No more death. No more regrets. Isn't that extraordinary? Look around at my circumstances, I can't see anything that gives me any hope of a situation like that. But God has given his word, his promise. In the face of terrible suffering, like that day in Samaria, friends, this is how hope starts. It doesn't just start with an idea of God. I believe in God and I have a vague idea and it's a comforting sort of idea. It's not like that. It's not as weak as that. It's not as vague as that. Now, this is how hope starts. Hear the word of the Lord. The Bible is, in fact, the story of the word of the Lord very important for us to realise the Bible is not just a book of information. You know, information about God so we can tell you all the things about God. Now that's true, but that's not, not essentially what the Bible is. And the Bible is not a book of information about things that God has done. It is that, but it's not essentially that. Essentially, the Bible is the story of God's promise, which has come to its full expression in what we now call the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of God's promises come together in this big promise. God has given his word. That's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is. It's God's promise. So that we can see that the suffering of Samaria that day was like the suffering of our suffering world. It was like our individual suffering worlds. And if we ask, is hope possible? The answer is yes, it really is, if you will hear the word of the Lord. And so the only question for all of us is, are you listening? Are you listening to God's promise? Whatever suffering we may encounter, Hope starts like this. Hear the word of the Lord. There's a promise. A promise from God. It's a big promise. It's a true promise. It's a reliable promise. And it makes hope possible whatever troubles we face. And the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is God's guarantee of his promise. Now, there's a little footnote that I better not uh, go into. Uh, our, our, our time is up, but there's a little footnote to this part one of the story that I'll leave you to think about for homework. If you look at chapter 7, verse 2, do this when you go home, not now. In uh, chapter 7, verse 2, there's one man at Elisha's front door who was in no mood to take seriously what he heard from inside the house. He was not prepared, you see, to hear the word of the Lord. And we'll see that, how that worked out for him next week. But for now, let's just pray together. Let's pause and...
reflect on what we've been thinking about and in whatever circumstances we find ourselves today. Whatever circumstances trouble us of which we know today. Let's take a moment to thank God for his word, his promise. My dear God and Heavenly Father, we thank you. It is not simply that you are there. We don't simply believe in God in that vague sense. But you've given us your word. You've promised. We pray, our Heavenly Father, that you'd fill our hearts with joy and peace in believing your promise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've just...